After a hot, dry spring, Oregon has a long wildfire season ahead. A new report says all of Northwest Oregon and much of Central Oregon are at above normal fire danger for all of July and August. Zach Ernest, outdoors editor for Statesman Journal and host of the Explore Oregon podcast, has been keeping a close eye on this summer's fire season. So today on CityCast Portland, he's here to tell us what to expect, knowing that the smoke could still be coming. It's Tuesday, July 11th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Zach, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. So what are you most concerned about this fire season? The thing that worries me is that we're going to have high and even extreme fire danger for like the next three months and maybe even longer um, unless unless something major changes. And that's just a long time for something to go sideways, like in, in better wildfire seasons, you know, we can push off high wildfire danger until like late July, even into August, but we're there now. Like we're at a place where it's going to be very easy for wildfires to get started and to grow. You know, if we get hit with a big strike of dry lightning, um, it could easily overwhelm fire crews because all these little sparks are turning into fires and then the fuels allow them to grow and get established more rapidly. Um, so that can lead to kind of a rough wildfire season, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen. I mean, we've had dry seasons. We've had a lot of droughts over the past decade. It doesn't always mean a terrible wildfire season at all. I think of 2015, which was actually the hottest and driest year on record. Um, it wasn't that terrible. Uh, for wildfires. So you still need those ingredients, that spark and that wind. It's just that the conditions are there and they're going to be there for a pretty long time, you know, barring like a a mid-season monsoon or something like that. Right. I've noticed that we've had these, you know, red flag warnings throughout the month. And I was confused because we had such a wet winter and I don't know, I thought everything got wet. So like, (laughs) why are we so dry now? Like what happened? I know. It was so good, especially in the winter. This winter, we had the best snowpack since 2008 at one point. Like we had the most snow in the mountains since 2008 and it it was looking really good. We had a great uh, early spring. Um, It was, you know, if you remember, it was it was rainy and drizzly like every day. And then it just changed in uh, May 1st. um, It just turned off. Like we have, it's been extremely dry and extremely hot since then. In fact, in Eugene, from if you look at May to right now, it's the driest on record. And Salem isn't that far off. Portland isn't that far off. And so that kind of means two things. I mean, because we got all that precipitation early on, it led to the growth of what we call fine fuels. So that's like grasses, shrubs, small timber and stuff like that. Oh, gotcha. So they grew really fast and, you know, but then they just dried out and, you know, there's fine fuels, they're small. And so they dry out really quick. And so when you don't get any precipitation, they just get crispy. And so if you drive around Oregon, you can see it like the grass is just brown all over the place and it's really flammable because of how dry it's been. So that fuel moisture is low. The fine fuels are very dry. And so it just doesn't take much for that fire to ignite and spread and get established because of that. So our wet winter basically just made us all the kindling. I mean, you still <laughs> want the wet winter. You still want that kind of stuff. It's you, it's good. But when we have these, you know, it's night. It was 90 degrees, I think, in, you know, really early in the season and everything just dries out so fast, you know, it can kind of turn against you a little bit. Yeah. I know that you said you can't really predict the future. I mean, either we're going to have, you know, a terrible fire season or nothing at all. But what sorts of outdoor burn limits are in place now, if any? Or do you see things getting to the point where, you know, if you're outdoor camping, you can't start any fire? What are you thinking, Zach? Yeah. So Mount Hood National Forest and the Columbia River Gorge scenic area began, you know, a ban on campfires on July 10th. And Mount Hood is often pretty early um, on on banning campfires uh, just because they get a lot of people from the Portland area. But I would expect to see other national forests follow suit, you know, by mid-July at least. So I think before you pack up the campfire wood and head out, you know, with uh, your camp fire supplies, like you'll want to check, like if it's you're going to a state park, check the website. If you're going to a national forest, Check that because I expect to see campfire bans start 
to become more common across the state. It's, it just, it kind of depends where you're going. Like if you go out to the coast, they're not going to have a campfire ban out there probably for a little bit longer because it's still cooler and wetter out there. But I, I think it's going to be a part of the recreation season this year is a, and that's a bummer. Like, you know, having mm-hmm. a campfire ban by geez, early July. Um, yeah, that, that kind of stinks. We've already seen one big fire in the region, uh, the Tunnel mm-hmm. Five fire, which was the Washington side of the Columbia River Gorge. And the w- reason I knew about that was because I follow one of the wineries on that side, Loop de Loop, <laughs> and they were, yeah. and I was literally thinking of going that weekend. It was like July Fourth weekend, mm-hmm. and they were just like, "Hey, we're closed," and and I was like, "Oh no!" And then I, you know, realized why, and and they and they were very sweetly putting up updates about their area and their neighbors yeah. because like 10 people lost homes or something like that. Yeah. I mean, they still haven't said exactly what happened, what caused it. The cause is still under investigation. I think the good news is that the fire hasn't grown very much, you know, and the same is true for other fires that have popped up this time of year. There's the Moon Mountain fire in Eugene. It's pretty well contained. I think what it shows is that like we're saying, like if you get a little spark and a little wind and, you know, those fires kind of popped up during a red flag warning when it was really hot, really windy. You know, the conditions are there for a fire to get established and grow pretty fast. The saving grace at this point is that we don't have a bunch of fires on the landscape yet. Like, there are a lot of firefighting resources that are ready to go and can hit these fires pretty hard when they do spark. Because what happens is as the fire season goes along and as there's more fires on the landscape, firefighting resources get stretched thin. And that's when you see like more and more pop up because there aren't the same amount of stuff. But it's early in the season. It's not crazy to have, you know, a big fire early in the season. That's happened in in Mm -hmm. the recent future. And then they get knocked down and it doesn't end up being a huge deal. This one, I mean, it's really a bummer to have homes being destroyed already. And that's really tragic. I don't think it necessarily means we're going to have a ton of fires necessarily like right away, if that makes sense. Yeah. It made me uh, a little bit more aware, you know, of Mm -hmm. what precautions I should be taking. I mean, aside from not doing dumb stuff like throwing fireworks into the gorge, like how can people be safe outdoors? It's knowing, you know, rules around campfires that campfires are are the big one um that tend to cause you know human ignited fires there's also open flames on grills and stuff like that that can do that be really careful uh with that but there's also simple stuff like you know there's there's swimming holes that get some that are popular sometimes and they'll get so popular that it spills out of the parking lots and into the side and people park on grass and that can be really flammable oh i've never thought about that there's a whole different, I mean, there's cigarette butts. There's a million different ways that you can, you can start a fire. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, doing something super dumb, like chucking a a firework into Eagle Creek. Um, It's being aware, I think, of all the ignition sources that, that you have that's, that surround us. Like, you know, even, even starting um, your little propane stove, like just, I don't know, be aware of where you're starting it. You know, there's, there's good lists that the Oregon Department of Forestry puts together. We put it at the end of a lot of stories that are just like, you know, here are the different ways you can start a fire. Uh, Don't do them. Yeah, (laughs) we'll throw that list in our show notes for anyone who's curious. Okay, let's take a quick break here. And when we come back, some advice on what to do if you find yourself stuck in a wildfire. Here's a little doomsday question. Uh, <laughs> I was, you know, I was talking to our producer, John, before we started talking. And I was like, you know what I realized is if, if I'm somewhere like in the gorge or anywhere and, and and like, I don't know how I would know, but we figure out that a, a wildfire started near us, like I would not know what to do. Like, I'm like, I'm pretty sure every decision I make will just make it so I get closer to that fire or I die in it. Like, I, <laughs> I have no, no clue, <laughs> you know, do you happen to have any suggestions like what because it happens occasionally, you know, when you're just like, oh, I've, I've been camping and they're just like, hey, you, we have to, you, everyone has to go because a fire started, you know, five miles away or whatever. I mean, it's it depends on the situation. Um, you know, they do a pretty good job of, of letting us know. So I was just rafting in the in the lower Deschutes and we saw smoke from the Tunnel 5 fire coming over and we were just like, oh, no. 
<laughs> like what, what happens if there's a fire like on the lower half of the Deschutes? And, you know, we had a satellite phone and we were able to get a text message, get information. Uh, there's a good alerts. Um, Evan Bright is is one that I use that, that, you know, lists all the incidents that are happening. But I don't know if you have to be that aware. Like, I mean, the emergency crews, were, unfortunately, this has become a part of reality here in Oregon. And I think you're seeing the state get better and better at emergency management and getting a text alerts out to people if there's a fire in the air and then they need to evacuate. We've, we've had people like I think of the Eagle Creek fire. We had those hikers stuck in there and they were in a terrible situation. They were stuck between two growing fires and we, were, we found a way to get them out, all out safely. So I think you'll be OK if you find yourself in that situation. Did you hear that? Zach said you're going to live. <laughs> he guaranteed it. <laughs> Sorry, Zach. It's just like, yeah, come after Zach's estate if it doesn't happen. Yeah, come on out. <laughs> I live on a creek, so if a, if a fire sweeps over my place, I'm just going to go sit in the creek. Is that real? Is that is that something yes. that you yes. you can just go into a creek? Let me tell you this story real quick. So okay. uh, during I wrote, you know, the Labor Day fires were obviously awful. And, you know, I covered that. I had to evacuate and everything. And that was really tough because that, that was a situation where nobody was prepared for. The fires just swept through communities. Is that 2020? Yeah, that was the, the 2020 Labor Day fires here in the Sanium Canyon. It was like apocalyptic. Yes, it was. It was the apocalypse. And, you know, I wrote the story about this guy named Don Myron, who's a real character, lives up the Little North Fork Canyon, where, I mean, the fire was, it was the apocalypse up there. There was fire everywhere. And what he did is he went down into the Little North Sanium River, and he stayed there on a little rock island in the middle of the creek, or in the middle of the river, all night. He got, he found, like, a little plastic chair that he used as, like, a shield from the embers. There was fire all around him, but he was in the creek, so the fire couldn't get to him. You know, he had a way to block the embers from, like, burning him, and he just sat there all night, waited for the fire to burn down, and even found, like, a beer on the side of the <laughs> river and Stop. drank a beer. So he's drinking a rolling rock, fighting off embers with a chair in the middle of a river, oh and... He survived and got and got out of there. He was no worse for the wear. He got out and was just like, okay, um, what's next? So if you find yourself surrounded by fire, just go to water. Um, go to water and wait for it to die down. <laughs> Dang! And hopefully you'll find a beer. Yeah, I know it was a. It was a, it was so funny. It was a it was a Rolling Rock, and so when the story went out, it went kind of like mini viral because it was a crazy story. And then Rolling Rock sent him a bunch of free beer. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, well, that's that's literally like the first good thing that I or not you know, but the first silver lining in the, in the in the shit show that was the 2020 Labor Day fires. Because if if you just move to town and you're like, what are they talking about? Our our sky here in Portland was a cloud of smoke. It was mm -hmm. so bad that they were just like, do not leave your house. Something bad's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, that was unusual. I wouldn't say. I mean, that's that was the strongest east wind event in recorded history for that time of year. It was highly unusual. Um, I mean, unusual stuff is happening more frequently now, but that's a very uncommon fire season. Like, that's not that that's not a typical Oregon fire season. That was a pretty freak storm that just lasted a long time. Yeah. You know, just thinking about this, like, because I feel like that's in everyone's head in a sense is like, it could get that bad because we've yeah. lived through it. We're just like, that was terrible. We had to make our own gas masks. Like we <laughs> it was just mm -hmm. crazy. So, you know, Oregon State University released a study earlier this year that temperatures will rise five degrees Fahrenheit by 2050. So was that just a, a, a predictor of what's going to come? Like, is there anything you think we can do to, to turn back the increasingly bad wildfire seasons we have? Or are we just like going to all have to find our rolling rock and just ride through? I think we just have to redefine what a bad wildfire season means. Like, I mean, through the entire 19... Hundreds, basically, Oregon had hardly any fire. Like it just, it just was so, so limited, and that's just not going to be true in the future. It's just, it's too warm. Oregon has been in just perpetual drought. At this point, I think the goal has been to focus on protecting communities, um, protecting homes, like using better home materials, defensible space, and if you do all that, you can have better outcomes than we had during the 2020 Labor Day fires. But we're, we're just going to have to live with more fires because climate change has just extended the fire season. 
by a lot, like in a short amount of time. Like I've been an outdoor reporter in Oregon for uh, about 15 years now, and I've seen the nature of fire season dramatically change just in my time here. Like just how long the fire season is, how severe it is. Um, I think we can be better prepared. Um, and I think we are, we're getting there, but summers are going to have more fire. Like that's, I don't foresee a way for that to change. We, you know, some years we'll get lucky. Like we've had really quiet fire years, 2019, there was barely any fire. Believe it or not, 2020 actually had almost no fire up until there was apocalyptic fire. So, I mean, that's what's the scary part is we thought we were in the clear and then it was September and you're like, cool, that was, that, we were fine. So, I mean, so much of Oregon's catastrophic wildfire is driven by one singular force and that is east winds they are the worst they just like a normal fire season it can be really hot it can be 100 degrees and you know kind of gusty and that's not you know that's bad but these east winds just they do everything it's like putting a blast furnace on any flame they knock down power lines then they take those sparks and fan them into giant infernos so almost all of oregon's major fire events every major run is due to east winds from like the tillamook burn back in the 1930s to the labor day fires to even last year like early september last year we had an east wind event and if you remember there was the milo mciver fire there was a fire in south salem the cedar creek fire blew up and it's just these these east winds are just a pox and they're coming across a landscape that's just already more dried out than it used to be well, you know, since we do tend to get wildfires up here, I heard there were these trails or areas that reopen after old fires. And um, I hear they're really cool. Not to say like, yay, wildfire. I mean, natural wildfires are going to happen no matter what. It's just, you know, if they're if we make them worse or not. But w tell me about that. Like, I've never hiked in a, and I think they're called fire scars. Like, I've mm -hmm. never hiked in that. Like, can you tell us a little bit about like where one could find one and you know, what you could find there. Yeah, no, for sure. I've found that I'm, I like writing about fire scars. I've been hiking and backpacking and fire scars for a long time now because I started in Southern Oregon and down there they have the Biscuit Fire, which was 2002. That was the first, that was almost like the canary in the coal mine for Oregon. It was this 500,000 acre fire that burned, uh, yeah, 2002. And you get to see you know, over the years, how the forest regenerates in different ways. And so that was an area that I that I hiked in a lot. More recently, we talked about the Labor Day fires just a little bit ago. Um, they the, the areas that they burned, the millions of acres that they burned were largely closed to recreation for a long time because of the danger, but they have started to, to reopen. And so if you go up around Detroit, area, which, you know, had had major fires, there's different trails that you can go. Um, there's one really interesting contrast. It's uh, there's the Rocky Top Trail, uh, which goes up right over the Opal Creek Valley, and you can see just how powerful that fire was. It was the Beachy Creek Fire, and you can see just like just a very severe burn because fires burn at very different intensities. Um, you know, after a fire, they'll usually go through and map like how severe a fire was. And so if you go up that Rocky Top Trail, you can see high severity fire and you can see it's kind of a wasteland. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's informative. It gives you a sense of the power of these fires. But if you go just a little ways, just a, not that far away, there's a peak, there's a hike called Stallman Point Trail above Detroit. And that goes up through the Lion's Head Fire Scar. And it's totally different. It's what you would probably refer to as like good fire. Um, it has, it burned at a much lower severity at that point. It was a little later in the event. And you can see how the fire just, you know, got rid of like all the brush and bramble and stuff that builds up along the forest floor, which is a big problem. Like us putting out all these fires has led to overstocked you know, forests, and you can see how good fire is helpful. It's, it left most of the big trees intact. It took out some of the smaller ones. It's, it kind of, it's almost like sweeping the forest floor. Isn't that what controlled fires are all about? Yes, exactly. That's, what, that's exactly what it is. But I mean, you know, this is, this is what, what they do. And so you can see it and it's kind of beautiful. You have like a blackened ground, you have a, you know, emerald forest canopy. Like there's so many different ways to explore fire scars. There's uh, around the Mount Jefferson area, the B&B &B complex from 2003 is there. And so you can see a legacy fire, you know, how does it look 20 years on, 25 years on? And you know, what's regrowing there, what's not. You can, you feel like a giant in the land of Lilliputians there because like all the trees that have grown up, like grow up to your like waist. That sounds so surreal. 
<laughs> yeah, it is. So the fire has been resetting the landscape in the Cascades for a millennia. Like it, it just always did that. And so the forest does bounce back. Um, so I recommend hiking in, in wildfire scars when you can um, and when it makes sense. It, do, it does get a lot hotter. There's a lot less shade, which is not so much fun. Um, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, Zach, thank you so much for taking the time and, and talking me through this. Thank you for the work you do. I hope that you stay safe out there. Yeah, thanks so much for, for having me on. It's it's a fascinating topic and, you know, it's not it's not going anywhere. So, yeah, thanks for having me. And now for your microdose of news. Lawyers for 24 unhoused people have put the city on notice that they intend to sue over the city's daytime camping ban. It's the first legal challenge to Portland's controversial new daytime camping ban. The policy went into effect last week, although the city says they're not actually enforcing it yet. And Oregon is super old and getting older. Not the state, but the population. It seems we have the oldest population of any state in the West except for Hawaii, according to new census data. Our median age is now 40.3, and that's two months older than in 2021. There is still a relatively large population of people in their 30s and 40s, but it turns out a lot of us just aren't having kids. It was noted that Multnomah County, Oregon's largest, uh, does have a median age of 38.8, which is almost exactly the same nationwide as a whole. For even more local news and events, sign up for our daily newsletter, Hey Portland. We'll throw a link in the show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend or leave us a good review. It really does help us out. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. <laughs>